What a glorious day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 It is such an honor and privilege to be able to spend this holiday season with you as a church. Uh, it's just a very glorious time to be in the house of the Lord. I, I love uh, Christmas. It's probably one of my favorite times of the year. It is. Uh, uh, I love everything about it. I love the decorations. I love the, the lights. I love the, the music and, 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 the, and the movies. It's just everything's so wonderful about Christmas. But, uh, you know, especially with kids, it's fun to see kids experience Christmas too and see the festivities for the first time. And, and uh, it's been a real blessing uh, just to see Christmas through their eyes because uh, when they see Christmas, their eyes light up just as much as the lights that they're looking at. So it's been a, uh, just a wonderful time of year. But it also, as I get older, it starts to make me think about all the thousands of people who are uh, dreading this time of year. People that are lonely and are uh, heartbroken and are isolated. And there are people who right this very second are finding this time of year almost more than they can bear because of that loneliness and isolation. And I don't know why, but uh, for me in my life, I, I really enjoy it when it gets a little bit colder and a little darker and, and some snow falls. It, it almost becomes uh, adventurous for me. And uh, But I know that winter depression is a very serious and uh, scary thing in our society. But we have to remember that Christmas isn't just about the presents. It's not about the material things. And it's not about having someone to cuddle by the fire with. You know, at Christmas is God's reminder that we are not alone. That when we look at Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection, we should also recognize God's reconciling love that rescues us from that separation and that loneliness. We are not alone. God sent his son from heaven to tell us that he loves us. So over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at this series that I'm going to call Glorious. And, you know, one of the, one of the biggest Christian pop bands right now is a, a band called For King and Country. And they have a song called, a Christmas song called Glorious. And if you want to look up a good Christmas song, you, know, there, you should look this song up for King of Country Glorious. And, um, and the chorus says, He is the chorus to every song that we were born to sing. He is the rhythm of your heart, so let the beat begin. He is glorious. He is the miracle of the love that set the people free. He is the wonder of the world that we have never seen. It's so glorious. He is glory. It's God glory. This is God with us. So in this series, I really want to take us back to the foundation of this Christmas story. And I want you to see the joy and the celebration that it should bring everybody that puts their faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God has come in the form of Jesus. He is glorious. He literally is God with us. So before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear and gracious Father, God, thank you for this glorious day that you have given us. God, please be with us as we uh, go through the birth of, of Jesus, God, and allow us to let it transform our lives. God, help us to remember the real reason for the season. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's in Jesus' personal name that I pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew. We're looking at chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, the very first <laughs> book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25, and as you turn to Matthew chapter 1, I want you to know that we can all be assured that Jesus is here with us. He is here to give us hope. He is here to forgive our sins and to give us a new song, but we have to be able to let him do those things for us. See, this Christmas message hasn't changed over 2,000 plus years, and it should be no different today. When Jesus came to this earth, he wasn't just an ordinary baby, and his birth was no ordinary story. It gives us hope for eternal life. Christmas still reminds us that God is with us. Let's all stand for the reading of God's holy word. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. May God bless you in his holy word. You may be seated. You may be seated. We took the boys to a place called Entertainment Junction, 80,000 square feet of unmatched family fun. That's how they advertise it. And uh, it was pretty cool. They have all, if, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's uh, in Westchester, Ohio. It holds the world's largest indoor train display. And uh, they have a Christmas uh, theme this year or every year during the time. And it was amazing. It was really cool. All the detail that these trains, are, you know, all the detail. It's amazing. The cities and the, and the, the, the little people and everything is so amazing. But the biggest reason that we went was because uh, a stay, you could take a picture with Santa Claus. So we thought, man, this would be great. If you go to the mall and get a picture with Santa Claus, you've got to deal with all the shoppers. I don't like dealing with all the shoppers. So I said, this would be a perfect way to do this. We can, I get to enjoy the trains, and then they get to have their picture with Santa Claus. It's going to be perfect. Now, we tell the boys that they're going to get their picture with Santa, and throughout the whole display, they were a little worried and stressed about this picture. When did we get this picture? They were nervous. You know, where, where's, where's Santa supposed to be? They were nervous. And Anyway, you go through all this display and stuff, and you get to the end, and Mrs. Claus gives you a cookie. Now, how cool is this? Freshly baked cookie. And then we took the boys inside to see Sammy in this little room. And you would think that we were taking the boys into a den of flesh-eating lions. They, they started screaming, and, and it was crazy. And I'm like, what's happening right now? And poor Sammy, he just sat there. Anyway, so we get our picture taken with him, and, and uh, it's hilarious. If you follow me on Facebook, you, you got to go look up this picture. It's hilarious. And, and we, we leave the room, and you can see uh, there's all these, like, computers, and they actually let you pick which one is the best. We had no best picture at all. <laughs> the kid's screaming. But as soon as Micah, our little one-year-old, as soon as he saw the picture, he started saying, cheese, smile. I said, why didn't you do that in the room? It's hilarious. The pictures are, are really funny, but uh, I just thought, well, that was everything. We, we, we start heading home, and that's all they talked about. The entire time, that's all I talked about was this picture of Santa. And I said, y'all, they were so worried and stressed that they did not, they weren't able to save the moment, right? And I, it started making me think, as Christians, we, we sometimes become so worried and stressed and, 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 and panicked during the holidays that we miss out on the opportunity to enjoy the moment, to enjoy spending time with each other, to enjoy the true reason of the season, which is the birth of our Savior. And sometimes we get so worked up and, that it flies by, and by the time that we reflect on what just happened, we, we realize just how fast it went by. You know, I used to work for a vending machine company in, in Ohio, and we used to have to go to Dayton, Ohio, to do their vending machines up there, and I, my route had a bunch of uh, hospitals I had to go to. And one of the hospitals always had our daily bread devotional books. So I'd always grab them when I could. And, and uh, there was a story in one of those uh, our daily bread devotional books about the time when uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright, the, the, the flying people, the Wright brothers, uh, flew for the first time. And they wrote back to their, to their sister, Catherine, and they said, we just flown 120 feet. We're going to be home for Christmas this year. And so Catherine runs to the, to the editor of the local newspaper, and she shows him this letter, and he reads it real fast and says, oh, great, the boys will be home. He missed out on one of the biggest news in human history, when man could fly because he was not paying his attention. So as we begin this Christmas season, it is so important that we, we don't become so busy that we miss out on the greatest news, or that we miss out on sharing the greatest news, which is the birth of Jesus. Christ. Jesus being born of a woman meant that he was fully human and also fully divine. Because he was fully divine, that meant he had the authority and the power and the ability to deliver us from our sins. But because he was fully human, that meant he would have to face the same things that we had to face. Temptations and, and feelings and needs. And this is why we're able to go with him with our problems and he completely understands. See, I love this passage because it shows us how Jesus came to formally be adopted and named by Joseph, despite Joseph being apprehensive about it. See, Joseph's role in naming Jesus is so important because at this time, that role of naming 
your kid fell on the responsibility of the legal father. It would ensure the official status of the son. It would, it would ensure that he is the heir to the family. So not only is the name Jesus significant prophetically, but, but it is also given to him by divine direction through the angels. And because Joseph had enough faith to do so, Jesus is, be, is able to be called the son of David because of the lineage of Joseph. See, Joseph never seems to get enough credit. Mary gets all this publicity. She gets sung, uh, sing, uh, songs sung about her. You know, some churches have statues of Mary. But Joseph gets no credit at all. But you see, it took faith for Joseph because he was stuck in, 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 in between a pickle, right? He had a, a pickle. He had to figure out if he wanted to stay with Mary who was pregnant with a child that wasn't his or would he choose to obey the angels who told him to marry her. How often do we find ourselves in a place where we have to make decisions? Left, right, up or down, Democrat or Republican, to be or not to be. It seems like there's always these choices that we have to make, one or the other. But with God, there is no limitations to our options. God will open doors that we never could imagine would be open. Nothing is too small for God. God is not limited. Last week, I officially became an ordained minister, and it was something that could only have happened by God's mighty hand leading me in. You know, one of the reasons that I probably ran from it so, so much is I didn't know what my options could be. I didn't know what God could really do. Where, where would he lead me? What could God do for me? Who would sit there and listen to Abram from Falmouth? And uh, I've been so blessed to, to, to see uh, his work firsthand. You know, I told Becky when, when I first uh, accepted that call on the ministry, I said, you better buckle up because it is going to be a wild ride in the past year and a half is has been so. We've been so blessed with different opportunities going to different churches and preaching in front of different congregations and it's so amazing to be able to share God's word with so many people and I'm so excited to see what God has in store for us in the near future but as we look at this passage this morning I want to focus on, on three things the miracle of Christmas, the truth of Christmas, and the message of Christmas. See Jesus is the miracle of Christmas. Webster Dictionary defines a miracle by an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. We may not see it or recognize it, but we see miracles all the time. We see miracles every day. We see miracles every second. You probably have no idea. I read an article this week that said that every time we take a breath, we're experiencing a miracle. Amen. It said the journey of this miracle begins when air passes through the nose where unwanted dust in the brief is filtered out. And it said the average person moves about 440 cubic feet of air through their, through their nose and through their lungs every single day. It said once in the lungs, the oxygen atoms travel throughout the entire body via blood vessels. And then they said this, and I have to look this up on Google because I didn't know if this was really true. But if you take all the blood vessels and you line them all out from end to end, that are in our body, it stretch out to like 100,000 miles. Right? It could wrap around the equator a few times. How cool is that? <laughs> anyway, at the end of its journey, going through all this process, the oxygen atoms enter individual cells, and it binds with our food, and it releases energy. Now, with every breath that we're taking, we're experiencing a miracle. For a lot of us, Christmas has become such a routine, and it's almost like muscle memory. The very first time I ever experienced muscle memory or recognized muscle memory was at Walmart. You know Walmart trains you on how to do muscle memory when you're scanning items? They actually train you. They want you to be able to not even think about it. Now, most cashiers, I think, ignore this because it takes them forever to ring it up. But I've developed muscle memory from Walmart, and I can, if you told me to go to a cash register right now, I can ring you up, and I can do it faster than most because of my muscle memory. But see, we've done this with Christmas. Every year we get into this routine, and so it's become muscle memory. We get in this routine. We've got to hang the lights up. We've got to do all the decorations. We've got to put the tree up. We've got to go see the family. Uh-oh. And uh, <laughs> I know some of you. <laughs> but Christmas cannot be a routine for us. It has to be a, a time where we really reflect on the year, where we really reflect on Jesus Christ. We cannot fall into the routine of Christmas. We have to recognize that Christmas was truly a miracle. It was an extraordinary event that manifested divine intervention in humans' affairs. God could have left us to our own demise, but instead he chose to give us his son as that final atonement for our sins. See, Christ is the miracle of Christmas because he has given us life. John 1 tells us that Christ was life. 
He is the, 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 the life giver, that he is the generator of life, the giver of life, the originator of life. John 3.16 says, For God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting what? Life. Life. First John 5, 11 through 12 says, The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have. The life. You see, I'm so thankful every single day for the miracle of Christmas. The miracle of Christmas is the greatest gift that anybody could ever ask for or receive. It is the truest sense of the word victory. But in our society today, I keep seeing a very scary pattern, which is the lack of truth. People are so determined to get people on their side that there is a lack of truth that is happening on, on our, in our society. But as we look at this passage, I want us to also focus on the truth of Christmas. And the truth of Christmas is the truth that all people who seek is found in Christ, for he is from the Holy Spirit. In verse 20 it says, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the greatest gift that could ever have been given to us. And one of the big things that we will hear this time of year is that word joy. You know, we'll, we'll sing about it, we'll talk about it, people will put Facebook status about the joy that they have in their life during this time of year. But in Psalm 16 it says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, God is in all and he fills all and he is through all. And it's not when God shows up, but it's when we show up. God, God has never left us. It's not when God shows up because God never left us. Amen. But it's when we show up that we're going to experience the joy. But sometimes we get so busy and we get so inside of our own head, especially during the holidays, we wonder where God is. And, and we sit there and we wonder where joy is. But if we are seeking to find, we will not be blessed with it. We need to be seeking God through prayer and studying and searching our hearts on a daily basis. There's no, there's no need to complicate it more than that than, than it needs to be. There are two things that I always tell the churches when they want me to get involved with them. I said, every, every church should do this. You, you should do these two things. You should be simple and consistent. You should be consistent in spreading the word of God. You should be consistent in meeting together. But you need to be simple as well. Not overcomplicate them. So many churches are, are doing these crazy uh, Christmas sermons that have nothing to do with the birth of Jesus because they're just overcomplicating everything. So many, so many people are, are, are trying to make Christmas something that it isn't because they're just overcomplicating things. But Christmas is a very simple thing and we need to be consistent in preaching that word. I, I believe that it should be very simple. That God sent his son to this earth and made it possible for us to seek him and to be trapped and not to be trapped in sin. You see, Christmas offers us Christ. And only he can fill the hearts with hope in the time of death. And only he can fill the heart with, with lasting joy in the time of sadness. And only he can fill the heart with peace in the time of fear. And when life reaches its moments of, des of desperation, our only hope is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the truth. We have a problem. And our problem is a, is a sin problem. And the first chapter of the New Testament points out our problem. And, and, and it's great because I always tell people, don't, don't tell me what the problem is unless you can give me a solution. Because there are a lot of people who are just going to give you negative things and they're just negative all the time and everything's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I always challenge people, give me a solution. And here on the very first page of the New Testament, God does that. He tells us what the problem is, which is sin. And he tells us what the answer is, which is his son, Jesus Christ. The truth about Christmas is all who seek is found in Jesus. He is the truth of Christmas. Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the light. That no man comes to the Father but through him. And lastly, I want to look at the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And because God is with us, we know that he will, we will never be separated from his love. Because God is with us, it assures us that we can accomplish his will for us. Because God is with us, we are able to overcome our fears. We are able to overcome our worries and our dissatisfaction. The message of Christmas isn't just the fact that God speaks to us today through his son, but that the message has the power to transform our lives. Because God is with us, we should celebrate. Christmas should be a, a celebration of the greatest message ever to be proclaimed. Right? That God came near to us so that we could draw near to him. 1 Timothy 2.6 says Jesus gave his life as a ransom for us all. The message of Christmas is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 
Jesus came just so that God could reveal himself and his plan to us in a way that we could uh, understand it. See, Jesus came to proclaim the greatest message that we can be set free from our sins that are holding on to our lives. So the question needs to become, why would he do that? Why would he do this? Because he wanted us to know how much he loved us. And he wanted us to know that we were created for a reason and a purpose so we might know him and love him. He came to proclaim that message that we have been set free and we don't have to be prisoners to our guilt and our regrets. By sending his son to this earth, God is giving us the clearest message of all, that nothing will separate us from his love. The good news that at last the Savior had come to save men and women from sin. In Matthew 1, 21, it says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus was the central theme of Christmas. The star, the song, the gift, the kneeling, the joy. Whatever word you want to use for Christmas, Jesus, it's all, it's all centered around him. It's all because of him. God's message to us is that he loves us. And he showed his love that Christmas morning when Christ came to this earth wrapped in swaddling clothes. The miracle, the truth, the message of Christmas all have a very common denominator. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus. So as we begin to reflect on another Christmas season, I think it's so important to remember why he came to this world and what he hoped to accomplish during his life and ministry. We need to let his motives be our motives. We need to let his goals be our goals. That God gave us the greatest gift on Christmas when he gave us his son. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You see, I think Billy Graham said it best. He said, no doctor in the world can treat sin. No, no psychiatrist in the world can cure sin. They can work on the symptoms, and, and they can help the sinner to live with his sin, but they cannot get rid of the disease. Only Jesus can heal us from the disease of sin. This is what the cross and the resurrection are all about. And Christmas is not Christmas without the message of the death and the resurrection of Christ. This is why he was born. This was the message of the first Christmas night. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The, the Christmas message says that God's grace is greater than our sin. It says that the sin question was answered on the cross. Christmas says that the cross went as deep as our knees. The cross was the cure that was offered and paid for. By our Lord and Savior, by a God who, who, who sent his beloved Son. This holiday season, I want you to give your heart to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because whether you're lonely, whether you're depressed or you're stressed or joyful this holiday season, Jesus Christ desperately wants a relationship with you. So with everybody's eyes closed and heads bowed, I want you to think about this question. How many of you right now will begin to start to pray? for a revival to, 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 to for your very souls? How many of you will start to pray for God to transform your very lives this Christmas season? How many of you are going to ask for an awakening spirit to help you overcome the trials and the struggles that you're going through this morning? You know, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let today be the day. Let this Christmas season be the season that you do so. Maybe you just need to rededicate your life because you're, you're afraid of, uh, of what's out there. You're afraid of, of, of the, the sin in your life. And you need to rededicate your life back to Jesus. Or maybe you just need somebody to pray with you because you're feeling lonely and heartbroken this time of year. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, I pray that you do it this morning. Let us pray. Dear and gracious Father God, thank you for this glorious day that you have given. Thank you, God, for bringing me here to Trinity Baptist Church to be able to share the birth of your, of your Savior, God, of your, of your Son, our Savior, God. I pray that as we continue through this Christmas season, God, I pray that we can get back to the foundation of Christmas. I pray, God, that we can keep it simple and be consistent in proclaiming the greatest message, which is your Son. I pray that you are with this church as they are going through this time of transitioning, God. I pray that you are with them and, and I pray that they seek your will. Moving forward. It's in Jesus' personal name that I pray. Amen.
surely 